it didn't work. I had to crash on mom's couch for six months. Like, hey, it's embarrassing, but it's fine. You know, and you kind of get yourself back on your feet and, and the world moves on. If you're a creative person, if you're a baker, a dancer, a photographer, a screenwriter, an actor, a comedian, a podcaster, and you want to figure out how to make a living doing what you love, this is the show. This is the show. Don't keep your day job. My name is Kathy Heller, and I'm a singer-songwriter. I make a living doing what I love, and I want that for you. This is the show that's going to help you do that and give you not only inspiration, but some real-life strategies. This is going to help you figure out how to take your creative passion and turn it into a profit. Thanks to Latote for supporting Don't Keep Your Day Job. Get started for as low as $39 a month and enter promo code DREAMJOB to get 50% off your first month. That's latote.com and promo code DREAMJOB for 50% off your first month. This episode of Don't Keep Your Day Job is brought to you also by Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash dreamjob. You're going to love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals from blueapron.com slash dreamjob. Hey, this is Kathy Heller. Welcome back to another episode of Don't Keep Your Day Job. I'm really excited. We have Nick Loper here today. Nick Loper hosts an awesome podcast of his own called Side Hustle. And I just wanted to get his perspective because he's been doing this for a while and he's met so many interesting people who figured out a way to do what they love and find a way to make some income while working at their day job, which I think is one approach. For some of you, it might be the best next step is to figure out a way to do something a little bit while you're still working at your current job. I know that sometimes you're just getting so, so frustrated and you're just dying to take the leap, but I do think it's a great idea to start to test the model, start to brainstorm, start to get some groundwork so that you have this like runway leading up to when you actually launch. And it's not a bad idea to start carving out that time now and getting yourself excited. And I'm telling you, I know you're going to say it's impossible because you don't have the time because you have a day job, but I know for myself, because I have three kids and I have several projects that I'm working on, and I was a person who once had jobs and also was working on my creative pursuits, that it can be done. It's just a matter of making the time, and when something's important to you, you will make the time. So I hope that you guys will be inspired by today's episode. I think Nick always has something interesting to share, and I'm looking forward to diving into that. Uh, Before we do, I also just wanted to say, uh, whatever you're going through right now, you are not alone. And I know that um, it sometimes feels like everybody else is just having the best time and has it so easy or has somebody who can help them to start their career or doesn't have this particular thing going on in their life like you do. Maybe you have a family member who's sick or maybe you're dealing with you know, a relationship that just ended or maybe you're dealing with living in such a far remote place and you feel like it's just so, 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 so far away um, what it is that you want to accomplish and that you feel like you're just alone in whatever struggle you're in. I just want you to know that everybody is in a struggle. When you go onto Facebook, everybody makes it look like things are just so perfect and they make sure to capture the one minute in the day when they and their spouse or their boyfriend or girlfriend or their kids where everything was perfect and that's what they project. But the truth is that everybody is dealing with something and you know that's true. So whatever you're going through right now in your life, whatever is frustrating, whatever mountain feels insurmountable, you're going to be okay and you're going to be able to get through that and you're not alone. You are not alone. When you walk down the street today, you can take solace in the fact that everybody who's walking past you, no matter how fancy their clothes are or however it looks like they have it all together, um, everyone's going through something. And even if they aren't, maybe they just went through something, but everybody gets it and you're not alone. And I think it's important to know that so that you have the strength to keep going. And all you have to do is sort of get through this minute and then the next minute. And one of the best ways actually to feel better is to go ahead and create something because creating something always makes, I don't know, it always makes me feel good, but I think it makes everyone feel good because you start to express yourself and you turn whatever you're feeling into something positive. And another thing you can do is reach out to somebody else and try to be there for somebody else. And that is truly one of the best reasons to get busy being creative because what you create will lift somebody else. Somebody once told me, that in order to help somebody out of a well, you have to have been down in a well once yourself. And so I think that the artists of the world, we're the ones who can find the language and find the medium, whether it's painting or drawing or songwriting or screenwriting, to tell stories because we've been able to 
articulate what it is that we've been through or what it is that we're feeling to help somebody else to feel something or to lift them out of wherever they are or to help them celebrate or just enjoy life a little bit more. The things that people create are the things that create magic in the world and it's all the color and it's all the beauty and I just encourage you to know that by doing your creative work, not only will you help yourself out of whatever slump you might be in, but you'll also help somebody else. So keep being creative and know that you're not alone and it's okay to not be okay all the time and it's okay to fall apart. Everybody falls apart. I just don't always feel perfect and I don't always feel like I have it all together. But I think one of the tricks in my life has been allowing myself to feel whatever it is I'm feeling. And when I run into people, quite often they'll say, oh, how's everything going? It seems like things are so amazing. You know, your podcast is doing so well. And I heard you're writing a book and I'll say, yeah, so that stuff is amazing. And there's always something else that's going on that's that's hard. Um, life is a mixed bag. It's what makes the symphony so beautiful. You have the low notes and the high notes and it's real. And I'm never one to gloss over that just because I want people to know that it's real and I don't ever want to project this false image like everything's perfect and it's not um, but it's beautiful and I read this beautiful quote I actually posted it on Instagram and it says things don't have to be perfect to be wonderful and they don't um, and I think actually expecting things to be amazing all the time really creates problems because then we have all of this resistance to you know, when things don't go right, when somebody sends us an email that's a little bit curt or when we get a flat tire or when we get to work late. And I think we need to just expect that it's always going to be both. It's always going to be the bitter with the sweet and we can just appreciate the sweet and know that this too shall pass. Everything always passes, you know, just like the good things sometimes have a way of passing. The bad stuff also passes, um, but we can hold them both in our experience at the same time. And I think that allows us to enjoy it and actually be with it and tolerate whatever is uncomfortable um, because we're not resisting it. We're just sort of expecting that that is life. That is the way it is. And that's what makes it so darn beautiful and painful and tragic and incredible. And nobody wants to leave the planet and everybody knows that they're racing against the clock. And even if you have, God willing, 70 or 80 years left, there's always this notion that you don't know how much time you have. And while you're enjoying something, you're also always saying goodbye to it because every day is a goodbye because we don't know how much time we have because nothing's been promised. So there is always that feeling for everyone, even a person who has the most perfect situation right now. Everybody's grappling with their own mortality, whether they are conscious of it or not. And so it's hard, it's painful, and it's beautiful. And that's what makes it so magical because every person is like fairy dust and a firefly. And it's like holding a moonbeam in your hand and you don't know how long you have it. And every moment, you know, my daughters are nine months and three and a half and five and a half. And every time I look at them, I wish I could freeze time because every moment that's so amazing, it's also a million little goodbyes because I know that soon... They won't be talking a certain way and they'll be a little older, which will also be cool, but I'll be saying goodbye to a, a different chapter and hello to a new chapter. And so it's a constant feeling of feeling so grateful and so happy and also the understanding that the more you have to be grateful for, the more vulnerable you are because the more you have to lose, the more there is at stake. And all of these things are going on for all of us all the time. And so, yeah, it makes it hard sometimes to then have the courage to move past all of that and go ahead and create something and consistently create something because I think creativity is like the highest frequency, the highest vibration of being alive. You know, there's like just, you know, enjoying the day. Then there's just sort of like, um, you know, doing your best and then there's creating stuff. And that is like the ultimate level. Um, I once heard somebody say, a friend of mine, she's really religious. She's like, when you're creating, you're like the closest to God because you're making something from nothing. You're using whatever God's given you, but you're creating something new. And I think that's true. It makes you feel unlimited to create something, to make something happen, whether it's a painting or a drawing or a song. And it wasn't there a moment before. It's, it's unbelievably um, satisfying and it feels like you touch the other world a little bit. So I encourage you to try to carve out like 15 minutes a day to be creative, whether it's finger paint or sidewalk chalk or playing at the piano, 
without any judgment, without being critical of yourself, just to get yourself in a creative space, I think is such an important, freeing, healthy, healing habit. And miraculous things happen from that place. Um, I'm so excited about next week's episode. We have Jonathan Adler here, who's an amazing potter turned designer turned household name of sophisticated modern glamour and it all started with him letting himself play so let's all do that a little bit more every day i love you guys thank you for listening to the show thank you for telling your friends about the show i saw a spike in our listeners last week and i think that's because some of you um heeded the call and i said my birthday wish my birthday was last week i said if everybody would just tell one person about the show we would double our audience so please keep going because i'm able to watch it and i'd love to be able to tell you in a few weeks time that everybody did that and we definitely did double our audience that would be such an incredible way to give back to me and to pay it forward if you feel like this show helps you or inspires you in even the tiniest way let's pay that forward so that i can hopefully help continue to be a champion for everybody to do their thing okay i want to thank latote for supporting our show you guys have to start using this it's so much fun latote is an awesome fashion subscription box that sends you brand name clothing and accessories for one low monthly fee Go to latote.com, that's L-E-T-O-T-E.com to get started for as low as $39 a month and enter promo code DREAMJOB to get 50% off your first month. So it's been so much fun over the last few months. I've been using Latote and I go onto their site and I get to personalize what it is I want them to send me. And they have amazing brands um, like BCBG and Nike and Rebecca Minkoff and Splendid, super fun stuff. I just really enjoy it because often when I'm going to the store, I'm rushed. I don't have the time to try things on. And with Latote, I get to play with stuff without the pressure of keeping it. So I get to choose things and they send me a whole bunch of stuff. And what I like, I can keep. What I don't like, I just send right back. And then they can send me more stuff. And if I don't want to keep anything, I could just use it as this way of playing and getting to try other people's clothes and closets. Um, And maybe I can try different styles that I wouldn't necessarily want to buy, but I would want to wear for like a day. So I think you guys should try it. Again, let's Latote dot com enter my code dream job and feel fabulous with fashion delivered right to your door this episode of don't keep your day job is brought to you also by blue apron i love blue apron we've been using it for a while it is awesome once a week i know that a box is coming to the house i open it up and there's always something interesting they never have duplicated the same recipe they send fish and chicken and vegetables everything is pre-packaged they are so conscientious about waste Um, And it's so much fun because everything's fresh. Nothing is already cooked. So I get to prepare fresh food, but it takes all the guesswork out of it. I don't have to go look up a recipe. I don't have to think about what I'm doing for dinner. It just comes to the door. It gives me a recipe card, tells me exactly what to do. You guys should definitely check this out. Plus, it's affordable, less than $10 per person per meal. And recipes aren't repeated, like I said, within a year. So you're never going to get bored. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash dreamjob. Okay, so without further ado, Nick Loper is here. He has written several books. He um, hosts one of the most popular podcasts called Side Hustle. He's got so many interesting things to say, and I'm so happy he's here. So let's dive in. Okay, so Nick, I'm so glad you're here. I love your show. I know so many people love your show. Thank you for doing it. Well, thanks for having me on. (laughs) Yeah, it's fun. So let's talk about you first before we get in and pick your brain and start to learn everything that you have to share with us. How did you start this? Where does this come from? What did you start out doing? Well, I started out like like what you're supposed to do. I started out with a with a corporate gig out of college, right. and it became apparent probably even before starting that job. I, was, I really have no desire to climb the the corporate ladder, right? And it could have just been uh, you know a cultural fit thing, but it was more just it was a really intimidating thought to be like thirty years of this like that does not sound right. that fun. Um, <laughs> so wah, wah. It, it, right. And yeah. so what I found myself doing, and, and luckily I kind of stumbled upon this even before starting that job, was affiliate marketing, which is essentially helping other companies sell their products and services. And what that looked like in practice was a footwear comparison shopping site. This is like super random. This was my first side hustle though. That became shoesniper.com after a lot of oh. years in in iteration. Interesting. So that's okay. So wow. So so that how many years did that take you to build that? So that was kind of a year from you know idea, maybe a little less than a year from idea to launch, and not counting kind of the the direct linking uh, paid traffic stuff uh, 
you know, kind of in the validation stage beforehand. So yeah. I had to hire a development team and actually found these guys on guru.com. Mm-hmm. So I got a few bids back and one of the guys just happened to be like half an hour away from me in uh, Northern Virginia near Washington, D.C. at the time. And so uh-huh. I just, you know, actually went over to his apartment and we kind of hashed out this deal. I think once he found out, it was just like one one dude and I was probably That's 20 two maybe maybe 23 yeah. at the time yeah. maybe, not even 23 he was like okay i'll cut you a deal it took like any software project took longer than they thought it would to build but they yeah, got yeah. it done they stuck to their fixed priced bid and then we were and then we were after the race it actually turned out to be a really good long-term relationship with those guys but this was my original side hustle this was the vehicle that let me quit my job so it was a comparison shopping site for shoes that made money on a referral basis for zappos and amazon and like all these other um you know online footwear retailers and it kind of played in the margin between the cost of traffic never really got a lot of seo love or organic traffic love but you know people were searching for these specific model of shoes and i could you know buy ads for those and and so it played in the margin between that and then what that traffic was worth in terms of, you know, average conversion rate and commissions from these stores. And so over the course of, you know, eight or nine years like that, that got narrower and narrower and narrower, shut it down summer of 2014. Mm-hmm. But by that time, I had managed to quit my job. So it was kind of started this in 2000. 5 2006 ish I quit my job in 2008 and then had to shut it down in, in 2014 but by that time I had started a few other side projects including Which... side hustle nation and then in 2013 kind of like actually kind of like at a low point of some soul searching stuff I was like what do I want to be what do I want to be known for when people google me what do I you yeah. know never get tired about talking about and like this brand this lower risk brand of entrepreneurship that is the side hustle was one that that stuck out so during during the time a couple of those side projects are still around and and one of them is the side hustle show and the side hustle nation blog and that's kind of been kind of grown into the main focus um four years later so the blog and podcast launched around the same time i'd been blogging on a personal domain since 2009 but it was just you know nonsense like here's what we did on our vacation here's some yeah. rant about current event like it, there wasn't any coherent message to okay. it until yeah. it's like okay i'm gonna rebrand i'm gonna you know only talk about you know part-time entrepreneurship and the struggles and the challenges and the case studies and stuff to go into that and that's kind of when things started to started to take off although very slowly at first and then started the podcast at the same time and the surprising thing was because i'd been writing for the last four years and you know, was a was a decent student in school. Like I definitely thought myself first as a writer and a podcast was something that like, oh, people say you ought to have a podcast. And so I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot yeah. and we'll see what happens. But it grew three times faster for that first year and it's continued to kind of outpace the growth of the of the written content by, I don't know, by quite a good margin. And I don't know why that is. And it's just like a less competitive sea to swim in or or what? I was just going to ask you that, but you just said you don't know why. I was going to say, why do you think it's grown? What do you think you're doing right? Well, I think the, the overlooked method of podcast marketing is like probably any marketing channel is is still word of mouth. I think that's how I've discovered new shows. And I think that's how a lot of people discover new shows. So consistency right. in putting out or trying to put out a quality program. I think yeah. the first 50, <laughs> like, I'm like, please don't go back and listen to the first 50 episodes. They're a little rough. <laughs> but it's that... You know, for me, it was like this learning process of trying something completely, completely new and not in being, you know, an introvert. It's like, well, I'll host an interview show. Let somebody else do the talking. Like, this is perfect. That's interesting. You call yourself an introvert. That's interesting. And the really the surprising benefit to doing the show has been, you know, now over 200 and something episodes is like been to build this network. And now when... I go to different conferences and even when we're just traveling for, you know, vacation or whatever, you know, all around the world, we've been able to meet up with, with listeners and readers. And it's just like that. Oh, I never expected really nice. that to happen. That's been yeah. kind of the most rewarding part of it. That's really, really nice. So what do you think is consistent in all the people who are successful that you've met? What are the things that you think are consistent traits or things that they've done? A willingness to put themselves out there without knowing the destination or without knowing the results which is tough because it's yeah. like 
you know, I want to, I want the sure thing. And you know what? The sure thing is, you know, the 10 year treasury bill that pays you like 1%. So it's like, well, that's not very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the photography example could be a good one because that's, that's my wife's side hustle. She's an engineer by day, but a uh, wedding photographer. Isn't that weird? That's the person that I picked because I looked through like hundreds (laughs) and I'm like, what about this woman? You're like, that's my wife. Yeah, that's, Let's yeah, talk about her for a second. We're, clo- we're close to home. This is Bryn. <laughs> okay, Bryn. Right, I saw that. Okay, so um, so Bryn is your wife, and tell us her story. So what happened? She started out as an engineer, got frustrated. What What's the whole story? Yeah, she was just like like how a lot of people get started, like a hobbyist photographer trying to you know kept upgrading the camera from just like a phone to a point and shoot to like a nicer point and shoot to a DSLR. And then, you know, her friend was, you know, super into photography. So they were like, you know, having these kind of geek out camera sessions on all the different settings and playing around with the stuff. And then one, I don't know if wine was involved or like one night, Uh. you know what, (laughs) let's, let's put an ad on Craigslist and see what happens. You know, it's kind of a, uh, uncharacteristic bolt of confidence, you know, for both of them to say, okay, let's, let's do this. So, so she yeah. and her partner at, at the time, I was like, who's, who's looking for photographers on Craigslist, you know, especially wedding photographers. This is the dumbest idea. And then like within a week they had booked up like six or seven weddings. I was like, okay, well, my, apparently, apparently my bad. And so they use that wow. kind of to kind of build up, uh, build up a portfolio to start out. And then since then they've probably raised their rates like 20 times. So it's been kind of an exciting. So how long has she been doing this now? I think this is year four. I think it started around the same time as um, as the Side Hustle Nation site. Is that her full time thing now or no? No, she still is doing the engineering thing full time. They'll do, okay. uh, you know, usually six to fifteen weddings a season. Got it. That's still awesome though, and it probably brings you guys like a nice little side chunk of money. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't hurt, and it's kind of a fun it's fun thing, fun thing to do. So I think they I think they enjoy it. So you talked about people willing to go for it without knowing the destination. What else do you think is is a consistent trait or maybe a tactic? So one of the other things that I see people doing well, especially starting out, is going where the target customers already are, go where the cash is already flowing, right? So in their case, it was this ad on Craigslist. In uh, another guest's case, it was the Etsy shop. She was doing wine-themed wedding decor, like place card holders made out of corks and stuff. Oh, yeah, cute. And so it was like, okay, I could build my own website, and eventually she did. But starting out, it's like nobody's going to be able to find me. So she went where the buyers already were and, you know, set up shop on, on Etsy. And she said the cool thing about that was, you know, she had her two or three listings based on the stuff that she had made, I think for her own wedding. And then she would get customer inquiries like, Oh, that looks cool. But can you do this? Uh, that looks cool, but can you make it this way? And so she's like, well, you know what? Now I've got another product listing and she's kind of built out her portfolio and her catalog in that way. It's like, man, this is awesome. And so that's kind of a fun one. So going where, going where the customers already are, and there's you know hundreds of examples of, of markets place like this. You know, Amazon is probably the the biggest, and yeah. I know they have like home Amazon handmade, I think, which is oh. apparently a tough application process to get in, but <laughs> uh, kind of you know their version of Etsy. And one of the exciting ones that we've been playing around with just this year is merch by Amazon. It's like a print on demand T-shirt. Oh, cool. Um, service i guess and i imagine they'll expand into mugs and hats and all sorts of things but just t-shirts for right now and we've i think we're closing in on a thousand bucks for the year so far just in uploading different designs like it's the lowest overhead business imaginable you just upload your designs to amazon they become you know searchable in you know one of the largest you know product search engines in the world and you know people can buy this stuff wow that's cool your show and your platform is called Side Hustle. So let's talk about what you think hustle means. What does it mean to hustle? What does yeah, it really controlling mean? Controlling the controllable is how I try and phrase it. Not necessarily, you know, burning the candle at all, both ends or, you know, wearing yourself ragged, but more taking responsibility, taking control for what you can in life. But what do you think goes into a really true hustle? Like, what do you think is that made of? What kind of hustle do people really need to get prepared to do in order to make anything successful? Well, it came from 
playing, you know, playing baseball as a, as a kid and the coach would be, you know, you're going to have good days, um, at the plate. You're going to have good days in the field or you're going to have bad days at the plate and bad days in the field. But you know what? Hustle never slumps. It's the one thing that you can always control. You can always run Mm -hmm. as fast as you can. You can always, you know, try your best in that sense. And so that's really what I'm trying to (laughs) instill on, on this site. It's like, you know, you, you may not be the smartest person in the world, you know, no matter where you're starting from, you know, high or low or what you're making at your day job or what kind of experience you have. It's like, you know, everything is learnable. And, you know, if you don't know it now, you can figure it out. In most cases, you can figure it out for free on YouTube or other sites. And it's just kind of this mindset thing of, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to do what it takes. I guess you could phrase it this way, right? If, if your definition of success is, you know, having control over your own calendar, having freedom to spend your time how you want to, I think you can do that today on a small scale, even if it's five minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes a day, I think you can do that um, and have that, have that taste, you know, even if, you know, eight, nine, 10 hours a day, you know, you're responsible for somebody else in your day job, you, you can reclaim a little bit and work on your projects during that time and, and just to have a taste. And then I think it compounds and builds as you, um, as you go forward. Even my, like my brother gave the example, he, I, we had a, a side hustle meetup. He lives in Seattle. So we had a side hustle meetup in Seattle last year and he pulled out this pretty elaborate, like habit tracking spreadsheet. And every day it was like, okay, I'm going to do my physical therapy. I'm going to do my meditation habit. I'm going to work five minutes on my website. I was like, well, so tell me about this five minute website thing. And it was like, look, you know, even after a long day of work, I always have time for five minutes before I go to bed. I'm going to, you know, work on this five minutes. That's like my commitment, my bare minimum commitment. Wow. If I get some momentum and I go 15, 30 minutes, like that's totally fine. Yeah. But it was like, this is, this is what it is. And over the course of the month, of course, it's like, oh, well, now I've put an hour and a half into this, you know, and it kind of compounds. It's like, even if you have very, very little time, you can still kind of make progress on a daily basis when you make it a habit. Yeah, that's nice. And that brings me to a point where people say all the time that the greatest resource they're lacking is the time. So what if somebody says to you, ah, that sounds really nice, but five minutes really turns into 30 minutes and I just don't have 30 minutes in my life and that's why I can't do anything I want to do. So there's lots of little time hacks that that you can do and and that I've learned over the years. So one of the best ones so far this year is that uh, is that prioritization of saying the night before here, here are my top three things that I'm going to work on the next day. Yeah. And you know, boom, one, two, three, you know, work on them in order as soon as I get up. And I've, the, the hack this year was like, make sure you do at least number one before diving into email, before you dive into social media. And that's been it just like, it helps me build so much positive momentum into the day. But when, when I was still working full time, it was much more difficult to do that so so i would block off kind of the time after dinner and before bed was usually like the hustle time and other people like that's that's sacred that's family time all right so you could flip the script on that and do it first thing in the morning or you know whatever no matter how busy you are you make time for your priorities yeah and Somebody, somebody sent me a note. It's like, I hate it when people say, you know, we all have the same 24 hours in the day. I've got four kids. You know, my 24 hours looks a lot different than yours. Yeah, it's like, yeah. those are your priorities and that's totally fine. And, you know, I wouldn't fault you for, you know, I don't want you to neglect your kids at all. But, you know, where you're at is often a, you know, the, the result of, you know, a, a, the lifetime accumulation of choices that you made. And yeah. so, you know, if you can kind of peel back those choices and I'm not suggesting like, well, and give your kids up for adoption or something but it's like you know how can you can you do you know ride sharing to their different events you know can you carpool to different things can you do you know babysitting sharing with another family to free up a night a week or something yeah. Yeah. there's different ways around it and one of the more interesting analogies that that I've kind of found for this actually my friend Julie she ran a, a podcast called Time Hackers mm-hmm. and she shared this analogy of, you know, the giant jar of, uh, of rocks. And you probably heard this analogy. The professor stands up at the top of the room with the, uh, the jar of rocks and he asks the yeah. class, hey, is this jar full? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, and of course the, you know, the class says, yeah. And then he dumps in a bunch of pebbles and he's like, well, now is it full? And of course they say, yeah. And then he dumps in the sand and then he dumps in the water. And, you know, each time there's room for more stuff. So he's like, and so Julie said, you know, the, the rocks or the boulders are, 
you know, the non-negotiables in life. You know, it's your sleep, it's your family, it's your job, but there's still a lot of room in and around those things. And so that was kind of the, um, and she had this whole system of like, you know, if you know you're going to have a, a 15 minute commute to work, okay, you can use that time for education. You can listen to an audiobook, audiobook, you can listen right. to a podcast during that time. If you know you're going to have a half hour lunch, you know, you can, you know, knock this out. If you know you're going to go watch your kid's soccer game, you can work this on the sideline. There's different different ways to work it into into the day. But It's all true. It's all true. I feel like every excuse that people come up with, because I know because I'm a human being just like everyone else and I have my own fears and I have my own excuses and I know when they're coming up, it's usually because I'm just afraid of doing the thing I know I need to do. And I think, I mean, the most common fear is just that feeling of our own inadequacy. You know, we don't want to start something if we're not really sure that it'll look perfect or we don't want to put something out there. And there's always this hesitancy to actually start because we don't have it all figured out. How do you do that? How do you start when you don't have it all figured out, when you're not perfect, but you really want to do something? Um, how do you just begin when you have a fear that it's not going to be everything it needs to be? Yeah. Do you ever do you ever have the thing where some some item sits on your to do list for like weeks or months at of a time? Of course. Yes. Of course. So I have found when that happens, and I've totally had the same thing. Um, when I found that happens, is it's like it's not. It must not be actionable. If it's that, if mm. if it just keeps sitting there, it's either not a priority like I thought it was, or it's not actionable enough. And so maybe it's too big of a project to bite off, right? So I had on my list of things to do this is a true story like this year redesign website it's like well i'm never going to sit down and say well i've got uh, a little bit of a, a block of time this afternoon i think i'm going to redesign <laughs> the uh, the website like it's too big right. of a project yeah and so what i had to do was okay step one you know research research different themes okay that was step one okay step two uh set up a test subdomain okay well i don't know how to do that so you know ask for some tech support on that uh install the new theme on the subdomain okay i can, I can figure that out right and okay. then you know trying to break these bigger daunting projects down yes. into smaller into like actionable steps so i had an, like i used to have like write a book on my to-do list and it's like again same thing it's never going to happen but right. it's like okay outline chapter one or outline this section and then when i was working working my last book project I even did this in excel kind of as like a punch list okay here are the sections that still need to be written and then you can kind right. of go through and knock them out it's like okay if i've got half an hour i can do that if i've got half an hour and the item is right book i'm just gonna go on facebook because i it's not gonna get done okay okay i love this so break it down into bite sizes how do you do that do you start with like what's the very first thing i can do or do you just start with like the low-hanging fruit or what how do you break it down i try to do it chronologically for something like, like the website redesign you know there's certain things that have to happen in in order for that but it's just like trying to make it so you can't not do it. And it's really satisfying to cross off that one thing. And I think you'll find that it builds momentum. So if it's, you know, find that test theme, you're like, holy crap, this looks awesome. You know, I can't wait to uh, install the hero image or I can imagine where my, you know, navigation right. menu is going to be. Right. And you right. kind of like, then you build that momentum and you're like, all right, let's, let's do this thing. So I don't know, that's, that's worked no, for me no, that makes and sense. it's kind of helped bust through some procrastination that that I've definitely felt and I think other people have uh, have felt too. Yeah, no, that makes sense. There's a bunch of different episodes. There's one where you had a pianist on who like started this um, website about piano teaching lessons. Is that correct? Yeah, this is Jacques Hopkins from piano yeah, in 21 days.com. Tell us about this. So Jacques was an engineer by trade too, but he actually quit his job to teach piano online full time, which is awesome. And he, what he said, he discovered kind of a, a hook, right? It's like I took years and years of classical piano lessons. And at the end of this, you know, 10 years of taking lessons, I could play like two songs and it was songs, you know, it was Mozart or Beethoven. It was like somebody right. that nobody's going to recognize. Yes. And right. so he kind of taught himself how to play pop songs, like radio songs. And you know, figured out how, you know, I had a unique way, I guess, of doing that. I don't play the piano, so I can't vouch for it. But apparently, I mean, he's got lots of students that swear by it. So, you know, he put up a video. I think the first video was Lips of an Angel by Hinder. 
you know, like, okay. you know, way back in the day and kind of left it alone, but had thousands and thousands of views on this video and people asking in the comments, you know, do you have sheet music for this? Like, how did you, how did you do this? And he kind of ignored it for years and years and years. And then when he was looking for side business ideas, it kind of hit him over the head, you know, because he said he was procrastinating by playing the piano when he should have been working on, you know, right, right, some other right. website projects. Right. It's more fun. Yeah. Yeah. So he's like, this is more fun. Like, how can I turn this into a business? And he's like, oh, I remember that video. Like that got a lot of engagement. And so he ended up doing oh, that funny. for another song and then kind of, you know, put together these other YouTube tutorials and it kind of has taken off from there. So no, not even at least when we spoke, not even a blog on his website, almost all driven from YouTube and then paid traffic on AdWords. And then now he's full-time teaching piano lessons online? Yeah, he's making like 20 grand a month doing this. Shut up. <laughs> it's nuts. He's making 20 grand a month. He's teaching people online. So he has basically like a online open classroom. Yeah. Um, and he just virtually teaches a bunch of people at one time. And so he makes t over $20,000 a month. He's got like almost no overhead. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful business. But the cool thing <laughs> about, is. about John is what he told me at the very end of that interview. He's like, I'm not selling piano lessons. And I was like, well, what do you mean? Of course you're selling piano lessons. He's like, no, I'm, I'm selling people the ability to play their favorite song on the piano. Right. It was like selling the result and not the, and not the thing. Mm -hmm. and I was like, oh. Okay. Okay. So I think he's a very smart um, marketing guy on top of having a, a pretty unique talent. And so he sells this through like AdWords. What does that mean? Does he use Facebook? For people who are novices like me in that world, what does that mean? Sure. So AdWords is Google's, you know, search marketing uh, tool, right? So if somebody's typing in, uh, learn how to play piano into Google, right. like he can have an ad on that, on that uh, keyword search. And so that's all he's doing. He's doing Google AdWords. He's not creating other kinds of content or is he still creating those videos? That probably helps. Yeah, I think he's still doing the YouTube stuff as well. And I think he is, has been blessed with some very nice YouTube rankings for you know piano learning types of keywords. Got and it. because his video is really compelling, like he's got a compelling hook to it. It's like, okay, you can learn piano in 21 days or I can teach you how to learn how to learn to play you know, popular songs really cool. on the piano. It's a cool party trick. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, it is. You know, so he's so he's kind of found a, a really cool niche there. So let's talk about this for a second, because this applies to anybody's business. Whatever it is that you're trying to sell, whether it's a product or a service like that, let's talk about creating content and let's talk about getting it seen. What are some of the strategies? Like you've already mentioned YouTube. We've already talked about AdWords. But if you're going into this, you don't know anything. What would you tell people to do? Would you say start with posting videos? Would you say use Instagram? What would you say is a good recipe to to be getting that? Start with where your customers are. So if you're, um, you know, if you're writing, you know, or if you're if your customers like to read, you know, you ought to be blogging. If your customers prefer learning through video, YouTube is is the place to go. With what I found was that the the podcast was the was the way to go and i think it's just an order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude less competitive mm -hmm. so i mean there's a million different ways to go about it so you know we, consider where your customers are and what type of content you know you can be excited about you can see yourself doing for for some time but would you say creating content is a must for every person or only for certain kinds of businesses really only for certain kind so the the shoe business you know had barely any content related to it the i mean freelancing type businesses you know probably don't need a ton of content to get started right. over time i think your your portfolio will speak for itself and you can use that to you know create content around like you know in the photography business now you know my wife and our partner can do content around you know here were the the top bridal flower arrangement type of trends, you know, for this year, or, you know, here is, uh, you know, here's some sample pictures from this venue, right? If people are searching for you know, inspiration for particular locations and stuff like that. But the, the content way is a kind of a, a slower way to go, right? Cause you're kind of like putting stuff out into the world and then hoping that somebody gets discovered versus going directly to your customer and asking if they want to pay you. Does that make Interesting. Sense? So you think advertising beats content? For speed, for sure. For speed. Interesting. 
I want to talk about two other episodes, and they were actually back to back, but I didn't know that when I chose them. Uh, okay. One of them is just so relevant because it's um, an episode you did in 2015 uh, on Halloween called Do the Scary Thing. And it's something that we talked about a couple minutes ago, but it's something that comes up all the time. What what came out of that episode we can talk about? In the notes of this episode, you say, um, you know, even though we're told to punch fear in the face, it's something that will be a constant in our lives and there's always something to be afraid of. So how do you move through that as you're starting your business? I think it's always going to be scary. And every time you put something out into the world and sign your name to it, there's the chance for ridicule. And that's, to be honest, like that's probably why I didn't start blogging on this stuff. I didn't start podcasting on this stuff. I didn't start, you know, posting videos on this stuff you know, when I, you know, years, years, years and years earlier, it was like, well, what are my friends going to think? Like, they're like, they're, you're not that smart. Mm-hmm. Like, who are you to be talking about this stuff? Like oh, that, totally get that was yep. comp- you know, probably unfounded, but like that was, you know, what will people think? Like that was a legitimate fear in my head. And so having to get over that took, <laughs> it took some time, <laughs> but yeah. the, I don't know, like, did you have that when you were starting the show? Oh, my God. Uh, in everything I've ever done. I mean, when I first went to start, you know, I started as a songwriter and eventually, you know, became successful at it. But when I first started, I would cancel every every time I'd book a session to record my song with a producer or to co-write something. Uh, I would just cancel it. I'd be like, ah, eh, you know, I don't know if anything I have to say is interesting. I don't know if the melody's good. I don't know if the lyrics are good. And I don't like that feeling of looking so foolish and silly. So I just not go, except that I would rationalize like, oh, I can't go because I got to help my mom or I can't go because I got to get my taxes done, even though that's four months from now. You know, I was just constantly canceling. And then it actually wound up working out. Um, And then I started an agency helping other artists. And I thought, oh, my God, I look so stupid. Like, who am I to pitch other people? I'm, you know, there's people who are even better than me. So why am I now, you know, expanding this and then that did really well and then I was featured in you know magazines and I thought why are they featuring me there's in fact (laughs) I was at the interview for Billboard magazine they wrote this full page story about my music career and I said to the guy interviewing me Phil Gallo who was editor I said why why are you interviewing me like why is this so interesting and he said never say that to somebody who's interviewing you (laughs) because you know you're making me feel like I'm not smart like I picked it I think it's cool and he's like and you know you should know that and I'm like that's a good lesson um and then I started a class online teaching songwriters and I thought again this is stupid because there's people who are way more successful and then a friend of mine said yeah but they're not teaching it you know they're not teaching songwriters how to make a living from songwriting and you are And then, you know, it just keeps growing. I had the meeting with my producers about this podcast and I thought, oh my God, this is ridiculous. Like, why are they picking me? And then the podcast did great. So I I live that. Yeah, thank you. I mean, but you did it too. I mean, you're doing amazing. So maybe that's that's a common theme of like, you know, people having to get over that imposter syndrome and saying, yes, I'm I'm expert enough. You know, people, like I, I may not be the world's, foremost expert on this, but I know more than most people and I'm going to give it a go. Yeah. So I guess, how do we break that down? I guess, how did we do that? Even though we both felt like imposters and we just did it anyway. I don't know. It takes courage, I guess, because you're feeling this, you're feeling the same fear. You're just doing it anyway. Yeah. One of the kind of cool ways to go about it, especially specifically related to podcasting is my friend, uh, Steve Young, who hosts a show about app development. He was a side hustling app developer himself and kind of started the show for the selfish reason of like, well, I want to talk to smart people and see how can sell more apps. Yeah. Right? And then the, smart. you know, when that's what he did, you know, at the very beginning it was like, oh, that was cool. You know, so I started to sell more apps by applying techniques that his guests would tell him. But now the show has taken on a life of his own. I think he's done like 500 episodes of this stuff now. And he's got a private mastermind. He did a live event, you know, for his audience. And it's like, oh, that's he, cool just that getting started and this is one of the biggest things that i've learned is you know picking what's next doesn't mean picking what's forever and you've seen it in just oh, like yeah. the half dozen different you know pivots and businesses and ideas oh my God, that you just so went many. through we we tend <laughs> yeah. to think and i thought the same thing with the shoe business like this could be my thing like i could do this for you who know who knows how long that's and true then, you know, there's a finite lifespan or once you're in motion, you start to see other opportunities pop up or, you know, you, you meet people along the way and you kind of go That's in different really directions. 
Yeah, that's really true. I feel like what happens for people is they get their identity all rolled up in this thing and they're like, this is such an existential question. Do I want to do this? Do I want to be songwriting or do I want to be just teaching this online course for five years, you know, for the next 50 years? It's like, well, you don't really have to look at it that way. You know, you don't have to be that extreme about it. Um, And I think that that dovetails into, you know, the next thing, which is I always say, like, you don't have to know the next 25 steps. Just do the next step because you don't know where that's going to lead to. And it sounds like that's how it was for you. You just did one thing. You were just trying it in college. Then it led to something else. And then right. you didn't know the next 14 steps, but you knew the next step. Right. And I, did, I definitely didn't know it was going to lead here. Um, I'm happy that it did. But, you know, it's kind of somebody <laughs> asked me the other day, well, what do you where do you see yourself in five years? Like, I don't you know the what I'm doing today would be unrecognizable to yeah. you know me five years ago and yeah, same yeah. thing five years before that it's kind of hard to hard to say where it's going to go next it's really fun it's really fun um the other episode i want to talk about came uh, right before that one and this one was about self-publishing and it was about i loved it because i'm a mom i have three kids and this is an episode about a woman who has she's a mom and she starts um, her self-publishing business and now i think she has like 50 titles you said on kindle so let's, let's talk about that for a second yeah, so this is uh, Yotsna or Yotsna Ramachandran. She's yeah. she actually is in India. Um, oh, she's built, in India doing this. Yeah, she's built up quite a business on the self-publishing front. Wow. Um, do, and so her model was actually kind of like this rapid um, production, like assembly line writing books, and you know having an outsourced editing team and a cover designer and right. you know all this stuff. And so when that kind of you know, wasn't very exciting. She was like, well, I can help other people publish her book. So she's transitioned into a business called Happy Self Publishing, where now, you know, she's leveraged this team that she's already built and helped other people, helping other people with their, uh, with their cover design and with their editing and with their, you know, formatting, get everything published onto Kindle and paperback. And it's just, uh, you know, kind of ballooned into uh, this, you know, this other empire where it's like, I started doing this thing for myself and now, you kind of I, now I started the agency right and she's kind of gone um, into that model so I'm excited for her I think well, she's got really a couple cool. kids now she's doing that over there actually I just met a woman who uh, is called uh, Teresa Greenway who's doing really really well teaching people how to bake the perfect sourdough on Udemy and oh my god she's let's got, talk about that so she's got a Facebook group of like 30,000 people who will want to learn how to bake sourdough from her and she's got a dozen different courses on you know how to make bagels and how to make pizza crust and how to make the world's perfect bread and she's she's awesome she started in kind of a really in a really dark place in an abusive relationship and found you know how to build her own income stream and she's just like so so gracious so excited about it so that's amazing so what about nate and he sold an idea to mattel that sounds creative what was he doing his idea was i guess a maybe i think it was a card game version of pictionary Mm-hmm. I could be off on that, but I, I got the idea that it was like a, a board game turned, you know, with a twist, you know, turned into a card game or something like so that. So he had an idea and he reached out to Mattel? Yeah. So he pitched this idea. And what I learned was these companies have kind of an intake process for for licensing people's ideas. Because they're like, well, you know, we we always have to be innovating. We always have to be coming up with stuff. We need to That's be open to suggestions from outside the company versus like, I was like, what you know what's to stop them from just saying thanks nate um yeah why why did you tell us that (laughs) but he's like no 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 it's like it's all you know kind of they have this whole formal you know pitch process and i think you make you know three to five percent royalties on that and you can do that for physical products or kind of like these you know idea products i think he ended up building a prototype and flying to new jersey or wherever to pitch this and you know he's a dentist like he's a full-time dentist in georgia and just cashing in some royalty checks from this game that was sold that's cool. i don't think it was sold in the states but i think it was sold you know around the world in canada that's really cool so let's talk about your blog for a second on your blog you have all kinds of interesting helpful articles and one of them is about the five things that you sort of a checklist before you know it's time to quit the job and go all in let's talk about that okay well let me bring this up to refresh my memory. <laughs> i think i think the point the first point was to be quitting to something and not from something because Mm. I think there's there's a lot of people who are you know just so sick of work unless it's like really abusive or really toxic you know running away is 
is probably not as good as running toward something. <laughs> so yeah. if, you have, like if you if you already have your side hustle and you say, look, I've, just imagine what I could do with an extra 40, 50 hours a week to this thing. I could grow this thing like crazy. It would be awesome. Right. Right. Like that's that's perfect. Yep. But if it's just like purely this escapist, like I got to get out of this cubicle, like I hate my boss, like that. Mm, okay. Because that might leave you more overwhelmed, not solve your problem. Okay. Right. So don't run from something, run to something. Okay. Yeah. Second and second one. thing, so applying to the, the the realm of side hustlers and creative people is like, well, do I have a track record? Do I have some revenue history of, of this business before I before I make the leap? Right? Like, do I yeah. know that this is making at least some sure. money? It doesn't yeah. have to be, you know, replacing your income. It doesn't even necessarily have to be fully covering your expenses yet because you, you know, imagine what you could do with an extra 40 hours a week. But just like, I think that's going to ease your anxiety a little bit yes, to have, have some track record. Yep. That makes now, sense. Now, the, the alternative to that is, or probably what would also be good to have is kind of your, uh, what we'll call in the startup world, like runway. And that's how many months can you last at your current mm-hmm. earning level? Or if your earnings went to zero, how, how long are you going to last on savings before you have to go back, uh, update that resume and <laughs> go look for another job? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, number four. Number four is your sales pipeline. Mm-hmm. And so for freelancers, you know, or especially freelancers and consultants, we kind of tend to go like from project to project. And then while we're working on that project, we're not really actively looking at the pipeline. And so once that dries up, we're kind of like, oh, crap, I don't have any sales. I don't have any money coming in. And so the best the best people kind of like are constantly filling that pipeline. They're working, you know, at least some portion of their day is dedicated to marketing, you know, whether that's creating content, whether that's, you know, pitching clients, whether yes. that's, you know, engaging in Facebook groups, whatever it is, yep. like you're kind of filling that pipeline. So you're not, you know, maybe you have one client and then it's a two months in two month engagement. And then you're like, yes. Oh, well now what? And yep. now you're kind of in this no income space. Yep. I get that. Um, and number five, this is kind of a kind of a depressing one to think about, but, <laughs> but an important one to consider. It's like how are your costs of living going to increase or decrease as you're newly self-employed? So yeah. if you're, you know, driving an hour to work every day, like I imagine your commuting costs might go down if you uh, are now going to be working from home. But the biggest thing, at least for people in the states, is you know what are you going to do for insurance? Right. It's like this constant question and it's a really expensive one to try and figure out well which you know i can go off the exchanges and they're you know crazy expensive for really poor coverage or i can try one of these like liberty health share i've had some friends you know try that and they said this is great but well it's like well how how big is this pool like you know if one person gets yeah. really sick like is this going to bankrupt the whole thing right. so it's hard to uh, hard to say and so that's kind of one question to consider before you're uh, before you're ready to uh, give your give your notice at work, right? And the last one, the bonus one, I like a lot. Let's talk about that one. So the bonus one, you know, on the on the before you quit your job checklist is taking a hard look at what's your worst case scenario, because I think we make it out to be way worse than it is. I'm never going to find another job. Like if I if I quit and this thing totally blows up in my face, wow. I'm ruined. Like no one is ever going to hire me again you know, my house is going to get foreclosed on and all this stuff. It's like, it can, it can happen, right? right. But I don't think it's, it's super really realistic. True. Like most of yeah. the stuff, it's not life-threatening. And, you know, I've seen people, hey, it didn't work. They went and they got another job. Like, that's totally fine. Hey, it didn't work. I had to crash on mom's couch for six months. Like, hey, it's embarrassing, but it's fine. You know, and you yeah. kind of get yourself back on your feet and, and the world moves on. Yep. Before we wrap up, I want to ask you about a couple, like, examples. So, Okay, so there's one of our listeners. She has a day job that she she likes it. She's a teacher, but she doesn't love it. What she really wants to do, she went to school for a musical theater, and she really wants to be able to audition for Broadway shows. And she's very, very talented. She went to like undergrad for theater, um, and she just feels stuck. She keeps writing to me saying, I just feel stuck. Like I have to be able to pay the bills, but I really need time to audition. And friends of hers who she went to musical theater school with are like on Broadway doing it. She just never took the leap. And so she's like, it's a real issue. Like, how do I pursue it when I need to pay the bills? Yeah, I wonder if there's a way to kind of minimize your overhead and maybe you get a roommate, maybe you can try. I don't know if she is, if she's in New York, but if she can travel there for the weekend, stay with one of her other friends and, and do the auditions at that time. But it's tough because, you know, we build these, it's like lifestyle creep and we've tried really hard to fight it, but we're still victim of it, you know. 
I can afford this car and I can afford this house and I can buy these things. And all of a sudden it's like, well, now I need to keep my job to pay for all this stuff. Yeah. I'm not saying that's necessarily the case here, but, you know, because there's always going to be, you know, kind of a base level bills to pay. Um, but you consider, you know, what could you do in uh, in your spare time when you're not auditioning to kind of build an income buffer or build a savings buffer that would afford you the, the flexibility to go do these auditions. And so that could be teaching other people the art and skill of, of acting, or it could be doing voiceover work, or it could be, you know, any number of, you know, different freelance or time, time flexible gigs. Yeah, that's one of them. Somebody else is interesting, one of our other listeners. So she's a cartoonist and she makes amazing things, amazing things. Um, recently, one of her cartoons actually went viral because she made this cartoon about her miscarriage and people don't usually talk about it. So she yeah. not only talked about it, but she talked about it in the most beautiful way. Um, and a celebrity liked it and actually like tweeted it and it kind of went viral a little bit. Um, but she she would love to be able to um, you know pay the bills being a cartoonist and she has a job you know for people like this who have these creative pursuits what are some of the things that they should be thinking about in order to you know hopefully one day be able to just do that full-time so i think in that case you can model the the people who've gone before you right like the oatmeal is probably the example that comes to the top right. of my mind where it's you know similar like these every every cartoon he puts out you know tends to go viral now because yep. he built up this audience but at the beginning it was still like oh this is too funny not to share right or this is too good not to share and it sounds like she kind of hit that on the head with this miscarriage cartoon yeah. another example um my friend steph halligan she runs a site called art to self.com mm -hmm. it started out just as like a daily you know doodle to herself and like some kind of like affirmation or reminder yeah, and cool. there was an email list component to that and she started taking kind of you know patreon style donations where it's like hey you know if you want to support my work you know it's three bucks a month seven bucks a month. i think she had a couple different tiers she ended up putting a book out uh, to support that as well um and then she does kind of freelance cartoon work for different companies and say hey look if you'd like to present your message in kind of a fun and unique way I can help you get that done. And so kind of that's how she's gone, gone about monetizing her cartoony skills. That That's really cool. I love how like I'm throwing out random things and you're like, oh, well, you could just do this. And then you have like examples as if you prepared this. He didn't. Um, <laughs> but one of the things you just said, uh, which comes up all the time is, you know, you were saying reaching out and asking, you know, do you want me to deliver your message in a cartoon? The whole idea of like that cold email, like the reaching out thing. Do you have any tricks? Do you have any hacks for that? Like how do people get through to the person, even especially when they have something worthwhile to share? Well, what you could do, one thing you could do in this case is... If you know who the decision maker is, if you know who the person is, you could draw them and say, I made this for you. Like that could oh be God, the subject so line. <laughs> I don't know. You, you could even do, depending on how long this would take you, you could do, you know, a sample. You could do the first pane of your cartoon for free um, or your comic for free um, and send it. Out. Like, is it something you guys would be interested in? Like there's, especially because it's such a cool skill. I think that one is an easier way to cut through the clutter than somebody yeah. else. That's interesting. But it sounds like in general, then what you could glean from that is if you're trying to get someone's attention, uh, actually anticipate what they might want and send it to them. <laughs> yeah. Like actually don't just ask somebody for an opportunity, but send them something that they might think is cool. Right. Well, people will send, I'm sure people send you this stuff at the same time. Hey, I made this cool infographic. Would you like to see it? I was like, why are you doing in three emails, which you could have done in one, yeah, just send, send totally. the thing. Or I, I wrote this really cool article. Can I send you the link? It's like, oh my dude, God, just send just it. It's send fine. The link. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, I totally hear that. Okay, last one. Uh, so this this is very common for our listeners. Several people have written to me about how they, one girl does this like hand lettering and she wants to start an Etsy shop and she wants to eventually, you know, make a full-time living from this hand lettering. She's pretty good at it too, as, cool. especially because she's a lefty and it still looks pretty awesome. So what's your advice to someone like that? Like, how do you stand out? There's so many other people doing stuff like that. Yeah, so it is crowded, but I do like the Etsy angle. I do like the like Zazzle creative market, um, Redbubble angle, like all these kind of marketplaces for stuff like that. Um, Artsicle, I don't know, there's a ton of them. Where one kind of cool way to productize that would be yeah. to turn it into a font, if, if that's a thing. Um, and 
it's a little bit more work because then it's not like super custom, but like those handwritten style fonts are really in and, you know, those sell for 49, 50 bucks, right? And you get a royalty on each one of those and then it's like oh, passive. Um, and that's there's, a, you know, a few different font marketplaces. Another one I talked to, actually, this was in the Buy Buttons book. A woman was a similar like, you know, graphic artist and or maybe she was like doing logos or something and she was doing freelance work. And so the clients would come back and say, you know, of those three designs, we like this one. And she's like, well, I already made these other two. So she ended up putting those up for sale on, oh, I think it was cool. creative market. She's like, I already did the work. And so, you know, she, you know, found a way to repurpose kind of what was typically discarded, you know, the, the waste, the byproduct of her business. I thought that was really smart. That is really smart. It's, That's it's, cool. It is time consuming. The other way to consider it would be, okay, can I niche this down into, uh, you know, t-shirts? Can I niche this down into wedding invitations? You know, how can I, you know, narrow it down to stand out? a little bit i don't know oh so you think that's interesting you think the more you can narrow something down the more you can stand out well especially for like something is as competitive as like handwritten you know graphic lettering because my no, sister-in-law is doing the same thing and it's like How, well, why is that that when you niche something down you stand out because then you know who to market to or then you know the ad words or why is both, that? Both. Yeah. You can yeah. say when people are looking for you and they, well, this is the go-to person for right. you know, so smart. hand lettering for baby birthday invitations or something. Yeah. Um, it's so or, true. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit tougher than say, well, I do it. I try to do everything to everyone. No, it's so true. When I started out with my music, I was kind of just writing all kinds of music. And a couple of my songs were more like upbeat, positive, happy. And somebody said, oh, those songs would be great for like McDonald's or whatever. And I said, oh, but that's not what I really do. What I really do is write these like heart wrenching songs. <laughs> and someone's like, no, but you should get known and you should write a bunch of those happy songs because you write them so well. And then people will come to you for happy songs. And um, in fact, someone said to me, your name is Kathy Heller. It kind of sounds like happy Heller, happy Heller, you know, like, and so then I, I just said, okay, fine. And so I niched myself like that and started emailing, you know, the people in the music business saying, when you need a happy song, um, because not many people were writing them and that totally worked. It's interesting. Oh, cool. Yeah, you're right. Um, all right. Well, you're just such a, like a, well, you're like an encyclopedia, like a Wikipedia of so many great ideas and you've ruminated over this for so long and you've done so many businesses. So it's been so fun to just, I ask you a question and you're just like, oh yeah, I already have four pages on that. No. <laughs> um, well, thank you. It's just like a body, a body of work trying to like pull it out of the memory, <laughs> try and dust no, it off and great. be like, when did I talk to this person? You're okay, so, I swear I talked to this you're such person. such a sweet, kind person. And I'm sure that doesn't hurt and why you've been so successful. So to sum up, what do you want to say to the people listening to you right now who want so much to do something? What do you want to say to them? It's all just an experiment, you know, try something out and see what happens. If it blows up in your face like that probably just disproved your hypothesis but if you position it as such i think it lessens that sting of failure and kind of says well um i'm going to think like a scientist and get just back to the drawing board and, and try something new the next time since you're here i want people to listen right now and if they're inspired i want them to get out a pen and like write down a couple things so in in a perfect world ideally what's the recipe go for it like Number one, what do I do? I spend a few hours a day working on something I love. Number two, I start putting it out there online. Number three, try to raise enough money and then jump ship. Like, just give us a couple go-to tangible things and everyone can write down a couple of things. Well, we can pick pick one thing. Like, if we pick the, like the, the hand lettering or the graphic artist, right? Okay. So doing, you know, if, the, if you want to create content, right? I think the content you create for that is you know, really easy, kind of like overhead cam, Instagram videos, mm -hmm. and, you know, research all the hashtags that you need to for that. Like, I, I guarantee you, like, those things are really popular from, from what I can tell based on my wife's feed. You know, that's really <laughs> a cool looking thing. You know, so that's one way to kind of start to get followers. And then on the, you know, how to get customers, if you can narrow down, okay, who do I want to work for? Or it's, it's so much easier if it's like a business client rather than like, you know, brides to be. Um, so you can send, you know, messages or you can like do handwritten notes directly to decision makers, you know, if they're yeah, working at companies versus, uh, you know, this blanket, well, it's a market of, you know, 7 million weddings every summer, right. something like that. Um, so it's a little bit more difficult to do it, um, to do it that way. But one method I really like is that, you know, give first 
ask second. And you're doing that on the one hand with the content, but you can do that on the second hand with the product as well. And so people have done this for me. They're like, I'm going to make this video for you. Like it's you know free to use how you wish. And if you want to continue, here's, here's how to go. Or it's like, Hey, I did this audit of your website. I found these three glaring SEO mistakes. Uh, you know, you can fix them yourself if you want, or you can hire me to do that and I get it done right. for you tomorrow. That's cool. You know, kind of like this, Hey, I know you, you probably get pitched all the time, but like, I'm a fan of your work. Or I'm a fan of your company. Like I made this for you, you know, use it as you will. It's my gift. Um, right. Solve a problem. If you're interested in something, it to them. Go the yeah, extra if you're interested in something long-term or, you know, I can do this for you. Or if you know anybody else who might be in the market, you know, I think that's, kind of uh, a cool way to go about it. That's awesome. Cool. Okay. Where can people find you? Side Hustle Nation and the Side Hustle Show podcast is available wherever fine podcasts are sold. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking all this time and offering us so much insight. I really, it's so easy to talk to you. I appreciate it. You bet. Thanks for having me. Nick, that was so much fun. You have covered so many different kinds of career paths and you've talked to so many people and I love listening to that. Okay, here are some of my takeaways. There are quite a few. Number one, put yourself out there even if you don't know the destination or the results. Number two, go to where the customers are. Number three, if you have little time, you can still make progress every day if you make it a habit. Even five minutes counts. Number four, no matter how busy you are, you'll make time for your priorities. It's true. Number five, break down big projects into bite-sized, actionable to-do items. Number six, picking what's next doesn't mean picking what's forever. Number seven, it's better to run towards something instead of running away from something. Number eight, be sure that your idea can make money. Number nine, fill up your sales pipeline. Number 10, when you're reaching out to someone, give first, ask second, help them solve a problem. And number 11, even in the worst case scenario, it's okay, the world will go on. Thank you guys for listening to Don't Keep Your Day Job. Please tell your friends about it. I am asking every one of you, please, if you love me, if you love the show, if you even like this show, if you feel like there's anything worthwhile about this show, I would love for each one of you right now to go onto Instagram or Facebook or Twitter and post a link, share a link to this episode or share a link to whatever episode you love or just to the uh, podcast in general. Tell your friends about it. It helps us so much. You have no idea. It costs you nothing. And by doing that, It's a way to totally 100% give back to us. And I can see it happening because I get to see how many people are newly subscribing or listening. So it makes me feel so good. It makes me feel like you guys are hearing me and listening to me. And it makes me feel like you guys care and appreciate what I'm doing, which is just an amazing, rewarding feeling. Also, if you want to do something else, you can support our sponsors. Go to Blue Apron. You can get free meals. Another thing that doesn't cost you anything, but by supporting our sponsors, you're definitely supporting us. I love you guys. I cannot wait for next week's show. Jonathan Adler will be here. We'll be talking about how he's become the magnificent person he is and how he's built what he's built. Keep going. Keep believing in yourself. And so much, so much is doable and possible. So much is waiting on the other side of hustle. Your life is waiting for you there. Keep going. I'll talk to you guys next week. I want to give a shout out to the amazing team who makes this show possible. Special thanks to our executive producer, Tim Street, and producer, Emma Kikuchi. The podcast is a production of Authentic. For more info on advertising in this show, visit AuthenticShows.com.